Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Navdeep and I'll be talking about our work titled MLIR based code generation for uh, GPU TensorFlow. Uh, we will start off with the motivation for our work. Uh, state of the art in high performance uh, deep learning is primarily driven by highly tuned libraries like QBlast, QDNN, and QTensor. These libraries are often hand optimized and tuned by expert programmers using low level languages and models and often require a significant amount of effort. A lot of this effort may need to be repeated for similar hardware, and this may not give optimal performance in all scenarios. So what we can try to do is, the, uh, is to make the process of developing these libraries uh, much more modular, systematic, and automatic. This can be done by building the right set of abstractions, transformations, and optimizations to generate code automatically. And of course, this could be made possible using MLIR. In this work, we focus on MATML and MATML-like operations as they are at the heart of uh, several deep learning workloads like BERT. Hence, they serve as an excellent starting point to evaluate the strengths of our approach. There have been numerous works on optimizing MATML, uh, which have been done previously, but none of them uses an uh, compiler IR infrastructure like MLIR. And as previously said, we believe that this approach makes the whole process more systematic, modular, and much more reusable. Now we will briefly discuss about the MLIR compiler infrastructure. So MLIR is a necessary based multi-level intermediate representation. The basic entity in MLIR is an operation, which is uh, generally known as an op. Depending upon the level of abstraction and the purpose of the op, the ops are grouped into dialects. Dialects help in representing low, mid and high levels of abstractions. For example, MATML in the linear algebra or the linear dialect is just a single op. When this op is lower down to the affine dialect, it becomes a loop nest with three loops uh, with the computation to do the MATML being present in the innermost loop. The ops in MLIR follow a hierarchical structure with the highest level op being the module op. A module op may contain many functions and each function will have a region attached to it that represents its body. A region is again a list of basic blocks. An operation can have arbitrary number of results and op rings and can have a region attached to it. For example, the affine.for operation shown in the figure takes five arguments. One is its loop induction variable and four other arguments. It produces four results and has a region attached to it, which represents the body of the for op. A question that one might ask is why use MLIR for code generation while there may be other ways to do it. And as said previously, MLIR is a multi-level IR and this multi-level nature of MLIR helps in a number of things. First, it helps in applying the right set of transformation at the right level in the IR. For example, simple canonicalizations like constant folding can happen at higher levels of abstractions like LMHLO or LINAL and can simplify the tasks for the lower, uh, lower levels of MLIR. While transformations like uh, fast memory buffer generation, uh, restructuring of loops can all be done conveniently in the affine dialect. Secondly, it helps to build reusable transformation passes for different backends. For example, the affine to tensor core mapping pass in the pipeline that we have developed can be leveraged to generate uh, target instructions for similar hardware, uh, hardware that is similar to tensor cores by just mapping the affineness to the right primitive operations. If used properly, MLIR can enhance the productivity of developers by providing helpful error and diagnostic messages which pinpoint to the problem and can save a lot of debugging time. MLIR has a great set of basic operations, dialects and types and is a truly extensible infrastructure. Users can define their own types, dialects and operations. It leverages LLVM's code generation backend for target code generation which are fairly well developed and quite reliable to use. So when using MLIR for NVIDIA GPU code gen, <clears throat> one has to lower the MLIR to LLVM IR after doing all the transformations. Then PTX is emitted by the LLVM NV PTX backend, which is given to NVIDIA's proprietary compiler to get the final executable binary. Moving on, we will discuss uh, in general about GPUs in tensor cores. So GPU stands for graphics processing unit and is a highly parallel uh, specialized piece of hardware and is primarily used for accelerating deep learning and machine learning workloads. GPU is a collection of streaming multiprocessors generally called SMs. Each SM is further partitioned into processing blocks. Each processing block has its own warp scheduler, dispatch unit, 
CUDA cores, tensor cores, and some special functional units. There is also a dedicated register file and instruction cache and a load store unit for each SM also. The memory hierarchy on the GPU can be abstracted into a four level hierarchy with restrictions on what entity can access what level of the memory. These levels are divided as follows. First, we have the registers which are local to a thread. We have the L1 cache which is local to an SM. We have the L2 cache which is shared among all the SMs. And finally, the slowest global memory which is also shared among all the SMs. The L1 cache can be partitioned to have a programmer controlled scratch card memory which is called shared memory and is quite useful to store frequently accessed data. The programming model of the GPU consists of the basic executing entity that is a thread. 32 threads are grouped together into a BOB and is uh, the basic scheduling entity on an SM. BOBs are further grouped into thread blocks and each thread block is bound to a single SM during its entire lifetime. Threads in the same thread block can communicate using the shared memory. With an exception, the threads in the same BOB can communicate with each other using BOB shuffle instructions. Threads from different thread blocks need to communicate using the global memory. Synchronization barriers in GPUs are present at the thread block and at the BOB level. Tensor cores are special units for matrix multiply accumulate or the MMA operation, which is essentially multiply accumulate on small matrices. They have higher performance than regular CUDA cores and hence are a suitable choice for accelerating machine learning and deep learning workloads. They originally operated on FP16 inputs way back when they were introduced in the Volta microarchitecture uh, and the accumulation was set to FP16 or FP32 depending upon the use case. But there are new data types uh, like int8 and BF16 etc which are supported now. Just for reference, the table shows the performance comparison between CUDA cores and tensor cores on the Ampere RTX 3090 Ti. CUDA cores offer 35.6 teraflops for both FP16 and FP32 accumulation, while the tensor cores offer 142 teraflops for FP16 and 71 teraflops for the FP32 accumulation. There are different ways of programming or accessing the tensor cores. The first uh, and the most easiest way to access or harness the tensor cores is to use a vendor provided library like QBlast or QDNL. They are usually the fastest, uh, but they have limited support for operator fusion. The second way is to use the WMMA or the Bob Matrix Multiply Accumulate API. This API provides utility functions for loading, computing, and storing small matrix fragments. The advantage is that the lowering of these utility functions to the actual machine instructions is offloaded to NVIDIA's compiler and the programmer does not have to worry about it. The downside though is that shared memory BAM conflicts cannot be totally avoided as the layouts in shared memory are limited to row major or column major. Because of the ease of programming that this method has to offer, we use it in our work. These functions are exposed as LLVM uh, intrinsics in the NVPTX backend which are accessed in MLIR using OPS in the GPU and the NVVM dialect, which were introduced by us. The last and the final way to uh, use the tensor cores is by using the raw MMA sync PTX instruction. This provides the best control over the band conflicts as the programmer can use switched uh, layouts in the shared memory. However, there are no utility functions available for loading and storing matrix operands to and fro from the memory. There are a lot of versions of the target MMA instructions and one might end up implementing a lot of low level functions to load and store the matrices and to the computer. One question, how big yes. is the shared memory? Uh, which one? How big is the shared memory? Yes, yeah, shared memory on this Ampere RTX 3090, it's uh, 48 kilobytes in its default configurations. There are different configurations which uh, vary according to the architecture, but what we have used is 48 kilobytes. Okay. Right. So moving on, uh, I will uh, now present the code generation pipeline that we have put together to uh, generate code for tensor cores. But before that, let's see what MATLAB on GPUs is all about. So MATLAB in the general form is represented by the equation D is equal to alpha times A into D plus beta times C, where alpha and beta and scalars and dimensions of ABC are M cross K, K cross N and M cross N. MATPEL has order of n cube computation on order of n square data, so roughly there's order of n reuse. It's at the heart of many deep learning models such as BERT as mentioned previously, and GPU vendor libraries like QBLAST usually have the fastest implementations. 
Other recent works such as Cutlass also achieve performance comparable with Q plus and provide um, uh, some more flexibility to the programmers. So uh, this is the pipeline that we have put together and this pipeline is really a collection of MLI transformation classes. The pipeline can take its input high level ops such as a linal.matml or an lmhlo.doc. These can easily be lowered to the affine loop nest form. Once in the affine dialect, we start off by tiling the loop nest twice. One level of tiles is processed by the thread blocks, while the other level of tiles is processed in parallel by the bobs. We create and place shared memory buffers at the right place in the IR. To reduce bank conflicts while accessing the shared memory, we pad the shared memory buffers with extra dummy elements. Next, we generate the WMMA tensor core operations and do some loop transformation necessary for optimal performance. Then we pipeline the main K loop to hide the latency of global memory loads. To completely realize latency hiding, we need an additional step which we postpone to a later point in the SCF dialect. At this point, we have all the memory operations required in the kernel, so we go on to insert the synchronization barriers to ensure correct accesses to the shared memory. Then we vectorize the shared memory copy loops, which are actually transferring data from global to shared memory as the vectorized transfers are much more faster, and then normalize these loops. Normalization here enables further canonicalizations in the IR, which bring some performance improvement in some cases. Next, we convert the affine.for operations to affine.parallel operations and collapse multiple perfectly nested ops into a simple affine.parallel op just for easy processing. Then we lower down to the SCF dialect as there are no more things that we want to do in the affine dialect. The SCF parallel operations are then mapped and converted to GPU dialect ops. As the final step, we do the transformation that we had earlier postponed to hide the global to shared memory load latency. We unroll the copy loops completely and move the stores away from the loads in such a way that the compute of the main key loop is sandwiched between them. This gives us the uh, desired latency hiding effect. After doing this, we lower to the standard dialect and then move on to the LLVM dialect. At this point, the IR is given to the existing utilities in MLIR to convert it to the final executable binary. So, so one more question yes. is, did you have to extend the affine dialect for doing any of these things? Yeah, affine dialect, uh, yes, uh, the affine WMA mapping pass had to be introduced. Okay. Then there were some extensions that were required to the fast buffer generation pass, uh, like the generation of fast memory buffers, which are placed in the shared memory. And there were some extensions for fusion as well. Okay, did you upstream any of these? Uh, for upstreaming, the GPU level ops are uh, currently upstream. The rest is uh, currently internal. Okay. Yes. Uh, so now that we have seen the sequence of passes in the pipeline, we'll now see a running example and see the performance impacts of the discussed optimizations. The IR that you see here is a night three loop nest uh, three loop implementation of Matmel. So when lowered through the uh, through MLIR and executing it on the tensor cores, we get 3.9 teraflops of performance out of this example. This is a square example of 8192 plus 8192 plus 8192. Uh, with mixed precision accumulation and is run on the Ampere RTX 3090. The machine peak here is 71 teraflops and Q plus for the same problem types gives us 68.2 teraflops. So tiling uh, is an important optimization in GPU codes which exhibit data reuse and MATML happens to be one of them. So we can tile the MATML code once and store the tiles in shared memory to prevent redundant accesses to the global memory. Uh, which are actually very costly. Each of the output tiles can then be processed in parallel by different thread blocks. Doing this optimization, we go up to 9.8 teraflops. Okay, so uh, as we tile for shared memory, uh, what we can try to do is uh, try to prevent redundant accesses to the shared memory as well. So we can tile the code once again and perform unroll and jam on the innermost loops uh, to achieve reuse in the registers. Each tile is also then assigned uh, to us to different warps to process in parallel. As a result of this optimization, uh, we get 10.3 teraflops. Uh, it's slightly higher than what we had before, but not that much. Uh, as we are working with shared memory, we must know what bank conflicts are. So shared memory is organized into 32 banks, each bank being four byte wide. 
when threads in the same bob access different locations in the same bank a bank conflict is said uh, is said to occur bank conflicts are serialized and hence reduce the effective bandwidth that you can get from the shared memory so just to point out our kernels have bank conflict free stores to the shared memory but we use the wma api uh, to load the operands of matrix multiplication into the registers which surprisingly resulted in bank conflicts so a general strategy to prevent bank conflicts is to pad the leading dimension of the matrices in shared memory uh, in a hope that the mapping of the elements in the data banks change and you get some reduction in bank conflicts and this actually worked so uh, but this is uh, not quite what we were hoping the performance actually dropped to 8.9 teraflops uh, and this suggests that we might be trying to optimize some other part of the code while the bottleneck might be lying in some other part so it actually turns out that the bottleneck uh, actually in the mathml kernel is the transfer from global to shared memory so now we'll see an optimization that can help reducing the global memory load latency it's well known that vector loads and stores are faster than scalar loads so we vectorize the global memory to shared memory data transfers and uh, mlir enables us to uh, <coughs> experiment with different bits very easily so we experimented with 32 64 and 128 bit and we found out that 128 bit works the best so we vectorized uh, these copy loops and we see that we get a performance improvement that and go up to 45.9 teraflops so now that we have enabled this let's just disable uh, disable uh, padding and see what happens so disabling padding drops the performance now to 30 teraflops so the padding was indeed working but we needed optimizations in other parts of the code there is one more optimization that we can do to hide the global memory load latency as discussed previously we pipeline the main key loops so that the load for the next iteration of the loop is overlapped with the compute for the current iteration so the first part of the figure shows the non-pipeline main key loop where each stage happens one after the other. There's a load from global memory stored to the shared memory and then there's compute on that data. The second part shows the pipeline main key loop. The compute for iteration zero is overlapped with the load operations of the next introduction, uh, uh, iteration. And hence data for the next compute iteration is available when it's ready to start. Doing this results in 67.2 uh, teraflops of performance, which is pretty close to what uh, Qplus has to offer. Uh, so now uh, we can just take a look at the kernel that is generated using our pipeline. So at the top, we see the load operations for C matrix, and at the bottom, there are store operations for the result back into the global memory. We stream the C matrix directly from global memory into the registers. After the loads for C matrix, we see copy loops for A and B matrix for the zeroth iteration of the main key loop. Uh, their presence here uh, is the result of pipelining the main key loop. Next, we see the main key loop. Inside the main key loop, we have loads and stores for the next iteration of the loop. Uh, between the loads and stores, we have the compute. This helps in achieving the latency hiding effect, uh, hiding effect from global memory. After the main key loop, we have the final iteration of the compute whose results are stored by the store operations below. Now that all optimizations are in place, we can see how else is the performance impacted. Turning off load store vectorization in the most optimized version drops the performance down to 37 teraflops as the loads from global memory are much more slower now. Only turning off padding brings down the performance to 38 teraflops as the loads from shared memory are now much more slow. Removing load store vectorization, latency hiding, and padding from the most optimal version reduces down the performance to 29 teraflops. In conclusion, uh, all of the transformations are actually necessary to give the most optimal performance for MATML on TensorCores. Apart from TensorCores, uh, apart from MATML, another commonly occurring pattern in deep learning models is MATML followed by some pointwise operation such as ReLU. Usually, uh, the operations that follow are order of n square and have a read after write dependency on the result of MATML. When using frameworks such as PyTorch without any other libraries, the following, following thing happens. You perform the MATML, store the result back to the global memory, then again load the result back from global memory into the registers, do the pointwise operations, and you may again store it back to the global memory. The store and load in between are the high latency operations and can be avoided by doing operator fusion of the pointwise op with matrix matrix multiplication. 
The operator fusion essentially consumes the result of the MAC mill when they are fresh in the registers, applies the pointwise op, and then just stores the result back to global memory once. This can lead to real performance improvements in small to medium problem sizes. Now we will take a look at the performance results of the code generated using our pipeline. Navdi, one question, yes. but the but yes. the fusion, yes. uh, the, the tensor core cannot do the pointwise op, right? Uh, no, they cannot do the pointwise op. Uh, the pointwise operations are done by the CUDA course. Okay, so then how will the fusion happen? So the fusion actually happens, uh, the results of the, the register set that is shared between the CUDA course and the tensor course. Okay. So what you basically oh, do is, you, yeah. How big is that set? Because if your data that is passed is big, okay. Uh, so that actually is as big as your tensor core size, is it? Yes, right. Okay. Uh, the register file is actually very large. Uh, it's uh, large enough to hold the results of one tile of what a thread block is processing. Okay. Yeah. And basically, you just eliminate the store and load from the global memory, uh, which is actually the performance killer here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Moving on. Uh, yes. Uh, what are the different sizes of matrix that uh, is compared against? So, the performance would vary for different matrix sizes, right? Yes, yes, yes. I'm coming to that. Actually, I have a plots for all of them. Uh, we go from 256 up to 16384 uh, in steps of 256. Okay. Yeah, so very small problem sizes to very large as well. Yeah, so now we'll take a look at the performance results of the code generated using our pipeline. So for the setup, we have evaluated our pipeline on Turing and Ampere architectures. Uh, on the Turing, it was 2080 Ti and Ampere, it's RTX 3090. Uh, on both uh, mixed and half precision. In the interest of time, we'll only look at the results from Ampere on mixed precision. The other results are available in the paper and I'll just uh, drop the link to the paper in the chat box after the talk. The SN clocks were set to the boost frequency mentioned in the white paper for all the experiments and the use only statically allocated to shared memory uh, that was available. The maximum number of registers was set to 255 and we consider maximum of the form C equal to A into B plus C. All the three matrices are stored in the row major layout and we use square problem sizes ranging from 256 to 16384 with a step of uh, 256. Uh, to calculate the teraflops, we use the raw kernel execution times uh, in all the experiments for uh, the baselines as well as ours. So first we'll be discussing the results of plain MacMill. So the uh, plot here shows the performance of our mixed precision MacMill kernels on Ampere. The performance uh, is between 0.95 times to 1.19 times of what uh, QPlus has to offer. So the purple line here denotes QPlus 11.2 and the green line denotes uh, the code generated by MLI, while the blue line is the peak performance of the device. Uh, this plot shows the performance of half precision uh, manual kernels on Ampere. The performance is between 0 0.80 to 1.60 of what QBlast has to offer. The reasons for better performance here is that the tile sizes that we used, uh, that, that we used by QBlast were actually slightly smaller than what we had optimal performance for. Also, uh, Qblas used multiple stage uh, pipelining to hide the global memory load latency. This actually increased the shared memory requirement to store multiple uh, tiles corresponding to the multiple stages and decreased the number of active bobs for SM, uh, which uh, were actually detrimental to the Qblas performance. Now we will move on to the performance results of some fused uh, kernels. So this is the performance plot for fused uh, review matrix matrix multiplication followed by review on the output. The comparison here is with Q plus LT, which is also an NVIDIA provided library and contains the fused implementation for review. The performance for both of the frameworks uh, is almost identical here. However, we see improvements when a fused library implementation is not present. For example, matrix addition followed by Matmal does not have a fused library implementation. Here we present the comparison of our automatically generated fused kernels with QPlus, MacMill followed by a custom handwritten kernel performing the matrix addition. Because of the redundant loads and stores, we see improvements up to 1.28 times over the non-fused counterparts. As we go on to add more kernels, which are candidates for fusion, we see more improvement. 
when relay is also added to the list of operations that follow that follow Matmel, we see more performance improvements that go up to 1.50x. It is also possible to fuse pointwise operations when they are present on the inputs to the Matmel. We present the results when radio is applied on the C input of Matmel. The gains that we see are up to 1.33 times on the non-fused counterparts. Apart from Matmel and the fused operations, we were also able to generate code for some Matmel-like examples like batch Matmel and tree rate tensor contractions. We will, we will discuss the results for these now. So batch Matmel is a Matmel uh, that has an extra data parallel dimension called the batch dimension. We identify the batch dimension and collapse it, one, it with one of the parallel dimensions of the Matmel. This reduces the loop nest into a canonical form and is handled efficiently by the rest of the pipeline. When compared against uh, QBLAS on some small to medium problem sizes, with different batch sizes, we see gains up to 1.28x. The reasons for better performance, the reason for better performance is that we use a small tile size 64 cross 64 cross 32 for all of the mentioned problem sizes and implicit parallelization across the batch dimension after collapsing also helps. A 3D contraction has an extra sequential dimension to perform the reduction in. We again detect and collapse the sequential dimension of the contraction with the sequential dimension of the matmel, which reduces the IR into a canonical form again. The comparison here is with QTensor, which is an NVIDIA provided library for tensor contractions. We obtain performance that is 0.87 times to 1.14 times of what QTensor has to offer. So finally, to conclude, uh, we introduce WMMA operations in the MLI and GPU dialect along with their loadings to NVVM uh, intrinsics. And these operations have been upstream. We demonstrate how MATML and MATML like operations can be systematically code generated as a sequence of MLI transformations and dialect loading passes. We leverage the same code generation pipeline to generate code for NVIDIA Turing and Ampere Micro architectures. We demonstrate the fusion of common pointwise operations such as ReLU, constant addition, and matrix addition with TensorFlow MATML. I would like to express my gratitude to all the contributors of the MLI project, especially the contributors of Refine, GPU, LLVM, and EVM dialects. And also, I would want to thank the developers and maintainers of the LLVM and VTX packet. So that was all from my side. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for listening. Yeah, uh, this may sound like a naive question, but like at one slide, you mentioned that like, uh, Vector operation at 128 bits performs better than 32 bits and 64. So, uh, yes. Uh, so I'm just curious, like if the vector operation is like 128 bits, then it means that more amount of data is like being fetched to and from the memory. Yes, but yeah, the available bandwidth actually is quite high. And uh, uh, if you just load 128 elements per thread, uh, you would actually load the elements uh, faster than loading one element per thread. Uh, the uh, vectorization is for the uh, copy loops, the loops copying the data from global to shared memory. So they are uh, much more faster in their vector form. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yes. And like, have you used this in production system? Like, is this in production system anywhere? Yes, and right now it's not in production. Uh, We're actually working towards that. Uh, we have hooked it up with TensorFlow. Uh, you write some code in TensorFlow, some MacML or some other thing. We can actually generate code uh, for it all the way to the back end through L uh, MLI. Uh, but that's uh, currently it's not uh, open source. Still uh, working on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks a lot. Tim. Thank you. Uh, uh, Navdeep, uh, so yes. uh, if we can uh, adopt this uh, same with uh, like a uh, the TVM ecosystem, right? So, uh, like, how, how do you comment on that? So, TVM and this thing, I think they are like actually orthogonal. I mean, you have yeah, to choose yeah. one thing, either you choose MLI yes. or maybe you can choose TVM. Uh, so, a TVM, I think uh, there's some requirement that you have to write the schedules of the codes that mm. you are going to execute yourself. And I think there were some auto schedulers also for TVM, yeah, yeah. but uh, not, not sure of how successful they were. Uh, while on this end on MLIR, we are now focusing on building automatic models that may, you, you may just not want to write the schedule and the model may detect the right schedule and most optimal one for you. And 
maybe generate code for that. But yeah, I think TVM and MLI are both are uh, like you have to choose one. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, uh, I think, uh, yeah, MLR gives uh, the more flexibility, right, for this compared to the TVM. Uh, yes, uh, I think so. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, even I think the node uh, dot AI, uh, I think so. Uh, even yeah. they're also like, they're also into with this MLR ecosystem. Uh, they're also into that. I think uh, there, there's one more Google project going on that's called IRI, I think. Uh, it's yeah, based yeah, on exactly. top of MLR. Yes. Yes, they're yes, using yes. IRE for their code generation. Yes, uh, yes, right, right. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, now that, uh, so uh, yes. currently it's targeted at a GP pipeline. So what, how uh, flexible is this to target the uh, CPU pipeline. Uh, uh, CPU also, yes, uh, CPU also, we have some like, uh, I think Professor Uday had some results for the CPU as well, matrix matrix multiplication on CPU, uh, I think in 2019. And uh, the results there was also like, they were quite encouraging. Okay. Uh, I can share a link to that as well if it's available in the chat box uh, in some time. Yeah. Yeah, that's also possible. But... 